Okay, according to my clock, it's time to start. <laughs> okay, so we have some grades. We sent out some grades to you today. We're working on it. It's, it's just enough of a teaser so that you know that, or at least you have hope that the rest of them are coming. Um, I think there are some corrections yet to be done there. I saw a, a student just showed me quiz eight. We had we still have an error in our key, at least for quiz eight and possibly for quiz seven as well. So, oh, but you don't have quiz seven yet, I don't think. Yeah, okay, so we're, we're working on it. We have a list, we're, we're cranking through it. Um, and feel free, when you have questions about your grades, feel free to post them to the Piazza. It takes us a long time to get to them, I know, I'm fully aware, but we absolutely will. Uh, all right, so you are in the middle of MP6. Keep going. Um, and we collectively were in the middle of talking about hash tables. So, hash tables. Dun, dun, dun. Um, and I want to address the issue that um, it's sort of this popular notion that hash tables give you an implementation for dictionaries where all the major functions are constant time. Okay, that's a, that's a sentence that you, with this, that you may have heard come out of somebody's mouth. So, a dictionary implementation where functions are constant time. And we're not really sure we believe that yet. We sort of understand how... Are we out of handouts? They were on that chair. That's not possible. Does anybody have extra handouts? Wow. You have extra handouts? One, will you share that one? Thank you. Okay, you guys all have to find friends. I know I printed off enough. Yes, this is, this is our little um, social engineering here, forcing people to talk to each other. All right, let me keep going, okay? All right, so, we haven't yet argued, really, that um, the dictionary functions are constant time on hash tables, or um, dictionary functions are constant time for hash tables. But we did see, we did see a running time chart last time, wherein all running times were in terms of alpha. Okay, so I'm going to continue this sort of little diatribe here. Okay. All running times were in terms of alpha. What was alpha? What was alpha? What's it called? What do we use that symbol to denote? Yeah, alpha, the load factor, of the table. Okay? I didn't ask you to memorize those running times really. All I wanted you to recognize was that number one, they were in terms of alpha, and number two, that they were increasing in alpha. So as alpha became larger, those values became larger as well. Okay, well, what is alpha defined to be? That is, what is the load factor? 
It's something over the table size. What is that something? Little n, which is your amount of data. So this is little n over big N, right? Okay, so here's the story. You cannot control little n. Your data is going to come at you as fast as it wants to come at you, right? You, you, the programmer, you, the implementer of this thing, have absolutely no control over how much data you get in a generally usable hash table. But you do well know that you have control over the table size. So what we're going to do, our strategy is going to be to hold alpha fixed by adjusting the table size. Okay, any question about that? So that whole table that we saw last time of running times that were, where the only parameter of interest was alpha, we are now going to hold that value constant and thus your hash your uh, hash table functions will be constant. Your dictionary functions will be constant, okay? So that's sort of the strategy. All right, so fall, to follow on to that, we recognize hash tables are implemented in an array, and we have consistently been worried about what to do if the array fills. Now, ignore alpha for the moment. What do we do? in a linear structure if the array fills. Somebody describe to me what we do. What's our strategy? Double the size of the array and copy the data. That's right. Very good. Okay, so I'm going to write that down for just a second. What if the array fills? We double the array and copy the data. Okay, so let's think about that in the context of hash tables. First of all, the question is just wrong because I just spent five minutes talking about the fact that we want to hold the load factor fixed. So instead of asking the question, uh, what if the array fills, we are going to say, what if the, the table becomes more than alpha full? What if the load factor exceeds some fixed value. So we're going to say, what if the load factor, here, I'm going to do it like this. What if, I'm going to scratch this out and write it a different color. What if alpha exceeds uh, about 0.6? Okay, and that's a constant value for your implementation, typically around 0 0.6. 0 0.6 is safe, 0 0.7. Okay, so what if alpha exceeds this fixed value? Well, the answer to that question is slightly different. Instead of doubling the array, we're going to double the size of the array and then find the next prime. So we're going to create a new table whose size is at least double, but prime. Okay, does that make sense? So we're going to resize to uh, the, the least prime greater than two times the current size. Okay, and we're not going to double the array. Okay, so we're going to resize. Now, notice we did that here. We had an array of size 5. We doubled it to get 10, and then we selected the next prime, which is 11. 11. Um, and there are 11 cells here. Okay, any question about that? If you're kind of wondering why prime, in particular, it has to do with our probing strategies, and it never will hurt you to have your table size be prime. So even if you're using separate chaining rather than um, one of the probing strategies, double hashing, for example, even then it's perfectly safe to have an array size that is prime. Okay, so that's the whole reason for it. Um, are there any other questions about this piece of it? Okay, the rest of the statement says then copy the data. 
So that means that meant before that we took our data from where it was and we just copied it down like this. Now, do you like that? Do you like it? Hmm. He's asking, so it must not be great. Okay? That's a reasonable thought here. Yeah? Yeah, we have to rehash. So let's back up and look and see what, what we're talking about. All right. So in order to place that key value there in that position of the cell, we ran it through some hash function. I'm going to call it h1 of x just to differentiate it from x. Um, and then took it mod table size, right? In this case, it was mod 5. Okay? in order to fit it there. Now, if we change the table size and we keep the hash function the same, then we're only going to be using this much of the table, right? So that can't be the thing. And if we change the hash function so that it is now what it was before, mod 11, and we put our data in these two spots, well, the next time we want to get our data, we're not going to be able to find it. So what we do instead, right, because it's very unlikely, in fact, I don't know, probably provably impossible, that h of something mod 5 is the same of h of that thing mod 11. Oh, yeah, it is possible, 56, yeah, duh. Okay, yeah. All right, but, but unlikely and certainly not guaranteed, okay? All right, so what we're going to do instead is we're going to take our keys and rehash them through this new hash function, through the new table size. And what might happen is, you know, this one's going to go here and this one's going to go over here, but that doesn't matter. We don't care. Okay? Any question about that? So we're going to take them all through. Now, Here's the moment, this is the moment that one of the characteristics for um, hash functions comes into play, where it, that it's important. So the first review is to think about the characteristics of hash functions, and the second review is to tell me which of them is relevant here. Okay, anybody got it? You want to talk about it? Are you worried about this strategy? Boy, it must be a lot of work to rehash these things. We don't have to worry about it because hash functions, what? Run in constant time, really good, that's right. So we don't have to worry about this because our hash functions, the characteristic of our hash functions um, that we care about is that they run in constant time. All right, any question about all of this? So now I think you have a pretty good view of um, how to resize a table uh, for uh, implementing a hash table. Yeah? Ah, very good question. Really good question. So the question, I hope you heard it. The question is, um, how do we find the next prime? And the answer to that is, you know, we just keep a table of the next primes, basically. Or we tap into somebody else's table of the next primes. We call somebody else's function for finding the next prime prime and they have a table that tells it to us. And the reason for that is because we really, even though, even though memory is big, we don't really need all that big of a prime relative to the magnitude of primes that we know about. So we might as well just keep a table of them. All right, and there are only particular ones we care about, right? We're always going to be choosing from among a fixed set, logarithmically many of them in the size of our data. So it's not a big deal. All right, but it's a great question. Anything else? Any other questions about this? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so this is great because I want to reinforce this. So remember, so the question is, why isn't the runtime linear of this? The answer is it is linear in this moment, but we don't have to do it very often. And the reason we don't have to do it very often is because we at least double the size of the array. So we fall back on that analysis that we did earlier in the semester. Okay? Is that okay? Is that okay? All right. 
So let me finish the writing here. Um, we resize to the least prime greater than twice the current size and rehash the data. Okay? And that's it. That's the, that's the answer uh, to how do, we, how do we deal with, or how do we hold uh, the load factor constant. Yeah? Um, so the keys, yeah, you know, I, I think I tried to refer to it, and I, I might have missed this class, that inside the cells, we're not just keeping the keys, we're keeping the keys in the data, the keys in the values. So we never really give up the keys. There are a couple different ways we could do it, though. We could just keep a, a table of indices and keys and a separate table of indices and values. It kind of doesn't matter. Okay, yes, we have to have access to the original keys. All right, anything else about this? Okay, um, I want to just discuss a few more little things relative to hashing. Um, we talked last time about two different collision resolution strategies, um, and you might be kind of wondering, well, how do you choose between them? In practice, they sort of represent two different extremes, um, and, in, uh, and what is commonly actually done is an array is built so that it has a few buckets within each index. So, so basically you're doing, uh, or a few spaces within each cell. So basically you can put three different key value pairs within each cell, thereby holding your data all in one table, but giving yourself a chain, a short chain, a fixed length chain within each uh, hashed value. Okay, so this is very common um, and sort of takes advantage of both characterist the characteristics of both separate chaining and probing. All right, um, so that said, if you had to choose between the extremes, how would you do it? And the answer is, you know what? If you can put your key value pairs in an array, you should do it. You sh if you can fit all of your data in one contiguous block of memory, go for it. If you must hang off your data, then it kind of doesn't matter whether you uh, use separate chaining or whether you store pointers to your data in your array. But if you can, if you can put all of your data into an array, that's good for, for, um, for just processing speed and caching behavior. All right, so if you have big records, though, it's very unlikely you can make a big enough array to handle them. So for big records, we sort of advocate for um, separate chaining. Since the data won't fit into a large array or into an array, if the data is very large. But for overall structure speed, um, probe-based strategies are better. OK. So the next question I wanted to discuss, this is really a miscellaneous slide. It's all over the place, I admit it. Um, the next question I wanted to discuss is what structures do hash tables replace for us? So now that we have hash tables, we never have to talk about what again? What implementation of dictionaries can we just say, okay, we're done. AVL trees, very good. So uh, they replace AVL trees. Um, because ABL trees implement those functions in logarithmic time, and they use uh, they, a pointer-based structure, which is by nature slower. So when we can, we're going to prefer a hash table implementation of a dictionary. Okay. Um, furthermore, so besides the running time, there's an additional constraint on the key space for ABL trees and binary search trees that does not affect hashing. 
What is it? What constraint, what must be true about the keys of an ABL tree that are, is not true at all about the keys um, of a hash table? Yeah? They have to be in order or another way of saying that is they have to be comparable. That's right. So um, ABL and BST require comparable keys. Any ordered structure does because it's the, com it's the comparison operator that gets you the order, basically defines the order. Okay, so, oh my gosh, we spent two weeks talking about binary search trees. So why did we do that if hash tables were going to win the, win the race completely? And the answer is that you can do more general things using binary search trees. A little teeny tiny example of which is the following. Suppose I query a structure for a key knowing that it doesn't exist, but I ask, what's the key closest to my key? That is, what if I'm doing nearest neighbor search? Okay, so why do we talk about this? So an example is nearest neighbor search. And the observation is simply that hash functions do not necessarily preserve distances between the keys that they hash. So just because, just because two keys, so I'm going to draw you a picture here. Just because two keys are close in their key space, it does not mean that they hash someplace close in the hash table, which means that you cannot use the hashed values for things like clustering or evaluating patterns that you would likely see in your keys. This topic of uh, hash functions that do preserve distances so that if, there, if something is a uh, given distance apart in the key space, it's, you know, that distance or, you know, some bound on the distance in the hash table, those are called locality preserving hash functions and they are extremely valuable. That is incredibly rich research area at this point. Um, uh, general purpose and locality preserving. Hash functions. Um, great implications in uh, big data. If I were still doing research, I think this is where I would go. Um, a friend on Facebook this weekend just published a manuscript, just linked a manuscript that he had finished, he'd recently finished. I'm like, oh, cool. So, it's fun. All right. Uh, applications of hashing, I'm not going to talk about that too much. You saw some um, basic applications of hashing in LabDict. Um, you know, among many, many, many other things, you can use them for frequencies, right? And basically histograms over your data, randomization, lots of different, lots of different applications. There are lots of different applications. Okay, so I want to move past um, dictionaries. So this is a moment where we change abstract data type, not just its implementation. Okay, are you ready? Any final questions about hash tables before we go on? Uh, you, this will not be the last you hear of them, for sure, but in this course, we're kind of done. So I have a secret mystery data structure. It's actually secret mystery abstract data type. It's, that's a misnomer. Um, here it is. Okay, that's a big container of something, I don't know what. Um, and what I want to know from you now is what kinds of things you can put into the structure. So the first thing we're going to try to figure out 
is what kinds of things you can put in the structure. And I'll tell you right now that you cannot put puppies into it. Okay? Sorry. We cannot put puppies into this structure. Do you want to guess a kind of thing that you can put in? Yeah? What? Yes, you can put integers in. Yes, you can put doubles. Yes, you can put strings. Anything else? Can you put me in it? No. You can't put people. You want to guess? Yeah? Oh, that's an interesting question. You can't put arrays. Yeah, you can put pointers. It's kind of weird, but you can. No, you can't put food. No, you can't put a dictionary in. Oh, no. No, no linked lists. You can put a vector. No, you can't put the secret mystery data structure in the secret mystery data structure. You can put a vector in. And by that, I don't mean an array. I mean a vector from calculus. Yeah? Excuse me? Um, so, yeah, but it's not very interesting. But yeah, sure, you can put a Boolean. Yeah. I think you can. Well, actually, I'm not sure. I'm actually not sure you can. Okay, so what is it? What characterizes these things right here compared with these things? Yeah, comparability. That's right. Again, this is, yes, I spent four minutes getting at the point that this kind of thing only holds comparable types. Okay, would anybody like to, so let's choose reals. So Boolean, do you think it should go in or not? Well, which is bigger, true or false? Which is bigger, true or false? I don't know. I don't know how to evaluate whether, I don't know. Okay, so the things that can go in are the things for which op less than is defined or comparable types. We don't have to get philosophical about it. And I'm going to ask you to... Uh, use the reals and ask me to insert, insert things into the structure. So go ahead and give me values now, not types, but values. Give me values and we'll use reals. 21 I can put in. Yep. Okay. Insert 21 there. Done. Pi I can put in. Yep. Anything else? That's it? That's all you want? Tau? Okay. Yeah. Zero, I can put zero in. That's it? That's all you got? E, okay, I'll put in E. Thank you. Negative one, sure. So I could put I in, right? But I didn't say, I, didn't, I only said real values. So I, I, but I could. I mean, I could use complex types, right? Because you get a magnitude for them. Oh, I know. Okay, but I asked for reals. So. Yeah, okay. What did you say? Yeah, I'll put in square root of 2. But you're making this really hard on me, and I'm going to put in negative 2, and I'm going to put in, no, negative 1 half. Okay. All right. So we can put all kinds of things in there. There are no, Ill, there are no um, unreasonable reals, okay? You can put all the real values in there, including the negative ones. All right, including the irrational ones, whatever. All right, so now ask me to remove something. Somebody raise their hand. We need to have a conversation. Ask me to remove something. Yeah, Neil? I'm not going to remove pi. In fact, you know what? You don't get to ask me exactly what to remove. You just have to say, remove something, and I'll decide what I'll remove. Thank you very much. 
Okay, so he said remove a particular thing, and I said no. So my implication here is that we are in the land of stacks and queues, where this is a um, this is a special purpose data structure where it gives you things in an order of its choosing. So would you like to try again? Would you like to try again? Yeah, just say remove something. Okay, I'd be happy to remove something. I'm going to remove negative one. Okay. Would anybody like me to, oh. Okay, would, should I remove something else? No. <laughs> this is like pop. You're asking me to pop, basically. Should I remove something else? Sure. Okay, I'm going to remove another thing. Okay. Any guesses about what I would remove next? Zero is right, very good. So, in fact, the remove function here, oh boy, am I going to get this right or not? Uh, the remove function here is not really remove, it's remove min. The abstract data type, the secret abstract data type here is a priority queue. Um, these are the classic functions, insert and remove min. Get size is a function of convenience, and it's easy to maintain, so why not maintain it? Um, and let's see, oh, and this would still be a priority queue if instead I defined the removal function as remove max. There is an analogous discussion for remove max um, all the way through. In our class, we're going to use um, priority queues that are ordered by minimum, so that's the only one I'm going to talk about, okay? All right, so we've got this new abstract data type. It's pretty straightforward, and as such, I think you won't be surprised at all about the impl implementations that we're going to consider. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to take a look at these two, these four implementations. So we have a sort, an unsorted array, an unsorted linked list, a sorted array, and a sorted linked list. And I filled out what I think are the running times here, but I was like, it was last night, and I wanted to go to bed, and so I think I might have made some mistakes. And so it's your job to correct my running timetable here, and I want you to do it as quickly as you can. Oh, and yeah, assume that the array can be resized efficiently. Anybody want to go up to the front and circle the things that are wrong on that table? I, I kind of want to throw this pen to you, but that I, we didn't sign waivers for that, so, okay. Go quick. Okay, good. Make sure you agree. Is that it? Okay. 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 Thanks. Anybody else want to add something? All right, we'll talk about it, okay? Thanks, Mark. Okay. Um, so I agree completely that if we're talking about an unsorted array and we want to insert into that thing, we don't have to think at all about where we insert. If our data looks like this and somebody inserts, go ahead and chunk it in the next spot, right? It doesn't matter where it is at all. We don't have to maintain any particular state of the system, okay? So we better be able to do that in constant time. Everything else here, I believe, is uh, true. This 
find minimum, you probably did that week one of your first programming class, right? Oh, but then you have to remove it. Oh, okay, you can. Remove in the array means closing down the hole, and remove in the list means finding it. Okay, uh, let's see. So any other questions about the top half there? All right. Yeah, you did. It's okay. No, I mean, you didn't. I didn't give you time. All right, yeah? Um, for up here, it's unsorted. So we don't care where you, where, where you put it. Okay, for down here, for down here, you're totally right. I'm trying to insert into the sorted array. Okay. All right. So um, for a sorted list, I know why that's log n, because I can use binary search to find what I want, right? 199, 90, 15, 2, 1. Okay, so I can use, if I want to insert 10, I can use binary search to find where I go, right? Even if I have my data in the backwards, whatever that means. Yes? So that login is correct. Yes? Yeah? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's right. I can find my spot in login time, but in order to actually insert the data, I need to make room, and so that is um, big O of N to shift. And, of course, I agree that even though I can do the insert in constant time for a linked list, I don't have a way of doing binary search to find where I insert. So, this is big O of N to find. Okay? Any question about it? All right, you can ask, well, maybe we should use skip lists. Well, that changes things in a way that we don't have the background to talk about yet. Okay? All right, um, I have a question for you. Which of these is best? Which is best? How do we choose? How are we going to implement these priority queues? Yeah, the answer is none of these are necessarily great. If it were the case that our data happened to be uh, sorted to begin with, and if we weren't making a lot of changes, then, you know, keeping it in a sorted array would be fine, would be, would be great. But we don't necessarily know that, it, that it's true, and to these, to these reasonable implementations of a priority queue, I want to add another possibility, okay? So, we don't have an answer for which of these is best. It's situation um, dependent. And we have another option. So take a look at this structure and tell me everything you can that's interesting to you about it. That is, tell me everything you can that characterizes it. What's true about it? I'm going to put bullet points here so we have places to put them. Twelve nodes, very good. Are they special? Yeah, it's a complete tree. Good, I'm going to write that down. This is a complete binary tree. Are you sure? Are you sure? So... Kind of unsorted. It depends on your perspective. Yeah? Yeah, look. Every child has key larger than its parent. Okay? Every child has key larger than its parent. Now, think about the implication there. In fact, in fact, it means that the root of every subtree is the smallest node in that subtree, right? 
so the root of the root is the smallest node in the whole tree and furthermore that's true recursively so uh, let's see how did you say it every key is greater than its parent I'm going to say greater than or equal to because we could actually have duplicate values here though we won't in our work I don't believe we could but we won't okay every key is greater than or equal to its parent now here's another implication of that this one 16 is going to be greater than 15 which is going to be greater than its parent which is 5 which is going to be greater than its parent and that's true everywhere so the implication is that every path from root to a leaf is an increasing path Now this thing is called a heap. There is a recursive definition of the structure, um, which starts with an empty tree is a heap, and uh, uh, R, T, L, and T, R, and T, L, and T, R must be heaps. I'm going to leave this incomplete, which is kind of funny. Um, I'm going to leave the, the recursive definition incomplete because I didn't do it um, last hour and I want to get to the next slide. Okay, so we will finish up the, we'll write, I will write the recursive definition of a heap carefully for you, but suffice to say the important characteristics we have already talked about, that this increasing path from a root to a leaf is absolutely important to us. All right, so now, unlike the structures on the previous page, we have this tree-based structure. So now what I want you to do is imagine class heap, okay? Imagine in your mind class heap. It will have private data associated with it. Um, tell me about some private member associated with the heap class. We've got, how are we going to hold on to this heap? Via? Via A? How are we going to, what does the private member of this class look like, you think? It's a tree, right? So, yeah, a root pointer, right? We probably have a tree node pointer called a root, and we've probably got an internal class called a tree node. Perfectly reasonable. And not at all what we do. So what do we do? Yeah, we'd stick this thing in an array or a vector, okay? The reason we can do that is because it's a complete tree. That's the only reason we can do it. If, heaps, if we did not have a complete tree, we couldn't use memory so efficiently. So all we do is we lay out the nodes in level order in, in an array. And as I hope, you know, we all feel quite affectionate toward arrays at this point. All right, so here's a little bit of a technical detail about how we do this. Um, instead of starting at position zero, the root is in position one, and I'll explain why in just a minute. And so I think this goes to 12, as you observed earlier, 10, 9. And in general, we're going to make sure that the array is a power of two. Okay, the size of the array is a power of two. So we're using our old strategy of doubling the size every time. So this tree right here would actually be stored in memory more like this. Now the arrays that we're going to, I'm sorry, the algorithms that we're going to run on this structure are still tree-based algorithms. That means we're still going to be interested in a left child and a right child of the structure. So rather than having pointers sitting there for that, we're going to have functions that we define that give us the left and right children. The way those are parameterized is if I ask for the left child of index i, I want to return, I want the address of that left child to be returned, and by address, I mean the index 
in which it dwells. So my question is, for any index i, where does its left child live? Yeah? Yeah, look at that. Who knew? It's in 2i, right? Okay, let's look. Where's 4's left child? Oh, it's in cell 2. Where's 2's left child? Oh, it's in cell 4. Okay, I'll bet 14's parent is in cell, I hope 5. Is 14's parent in cell 5? Yep, look at that. Okay, so we have this nifty little function that helps us navigate the tree, this navigate the tree as if it were pointer-based, right? So now we can, we can do what we could do before. All right, well, similarly, there's a nice function for right child, and it is, yeah, that's right. These are laid out in level order, so that right child always, the right sibling is always the next one. It's convenient to also have the parent of i, and that is just, yeah, the floor of i over 2, or integer division on i over 2. Okay, any question about that? So now look, we're kind of sneaking something in on you here. Because in MP6, how did you implement that tree? The KD tree? It was in an array, right? It's like, you took the, it's like you took the KD tree, which is essentially a binary search tree in additional dimensions, and you smashed it down into an array. And that one isn't even a complete tree. It's got holes in different places. Here's yet another strategy for taking a complete tree and using an array to store it. This is because, this is because those dynamic um, those dynamic structures, those pointer-based structures, are expensive. If we can lay things out in memory, we're going to. All right, any question about that? Is it okay? All right, so I have one little... Uh, oh, I know. Tell me some values that I could insert into this tree in just without even thinking about it in constant time. What are some values that I could insert into this tree in constant time? Anything? Well, yeah. Yeah? Eight? Can I insert eight into this tree in constant time? Why? Where do I put it? Oh, look, the place where it's easy for me to insert things in constant time is right here, right? So I can put a lot of stuff there. I can put 8 or 9 or 10. Anything greater than 7 can legitimately be added to the structure in this moment. So the question, the teaser is, what happens if the next key I need to add to the structure is Where is it easy to insert to? Oh, ah, I know what you want to say. I should have said, I should have said, uh, oh, eight. <laughs> Eight's a really good one. Five, let's pretend five. Let's pretend that's not five. That, that one over there is like 5.8 or something, okay? Let's add five. So I want to add five to this structure. Where is it easy to put it? Right there. But, but, it's no longer true if I put it here that the path from five to the root is a decreasing path. Oh no, I wonder what I could do to fix it. And that's where we'll start next time.